This is chapter 14, the first section that will start new material on the final exam. So we're going to start off talking about seeds because the last two plant groups are the groups that have seeds. That's one of the characteristics. Um, we'll see that there are characteristics that separate the two groups, um, both what we call the gymnosperms and the angiosperms, but they both have seeds. And these seeds allow these two groups to do something that the other two groups, the non-vascular and the vascular seedless plants couldn't do. So what is a seed? Well, a seed has a specialized structure. You can see here, it's got a protective outer layer and uh, spores from the vascular seedless and the non-vascular plants have a protective coating. But what they don't have is this stuff right here, this endosperm. Um, and so we'll see that endosperm, it's a, f it's a food source, but we'll see on the next slide what it is. And then they also have an embryo, which a spore is basically just the embryo with a, a wrapper on it. So um, what these seeds do is they will land in a new place and when they get there, what they're going to do is they're going to use that food in the seed to help them grow their roots and then eventually their shoots so that then they can start doing photosynthesis. So they actually won't start doing photosynthesis until their shoots break above ground. And that's what the big advantage of having a seed is. Um, it also allows you to grow in places that aren't necessarily the best place for you to grow. So spores, we saw spores with the non-vascular and the uh, vascular seedless plant groups. And the spores are just like I said, it's a wrapper and it has DNA, some RNA and some proteins. And that's it. In order to make it as a spore, you need to land in just the right place with just the right water and nutrients in order to make it. Um, this is why these plants make thousands to sometimes millions of spores and in the hopes of just a few of them actually surviving to grow into new plants. Seeds, on the other hand, we saw have that multicellular embryo that will grow into the new plant but it also has that endosperm. And that endosperm is a store of nutrients, a store of food. It's mostly starch, which if you remember when we talked about carbohydrates, carbohydrates are a great energy source and starch is really good because it's got lots of energy stored in that molecule. And so it gives a really good start to that new baby plant. Um, it gives them the ability to start growing as long as they can get water. And so if they land in a place where they can get water, they can start growing. It also allows them to survive for a little while, even if there's no water. <sighs> Sorry about that. The headphones keep making me yawn. I keep pressing. Um, so the seeds are produced just by gymnosperms and angiosperms. And the seeds allow these plants to move to new areas, areas that the non-vascular and the vascular seedless plants hadn't been able to get to before. So the big thing too with seeds is allowed them to disperse. So the gymnosperms and the angiosperms have different ways of doing this, um, but they don't necessarily all rely on the wind like spores do. So remember spores had to be moved around by the wind because that's the only way that they can get away from their uh, parent plant. But for angiosperms and gymnosperms, the seeds and seed pods have lots of ways to be able to get away from the parent plant. I'll link the video for this one um, because this one's kind of interesting and most people don't know about these. Um, there are some plants that literally explode their seed pods um, to get the seeds away from the plant. And so you'll see there are some that when they get brushed up against like touch me knots, which we have here in Ohio, the pods literally burst to shoot the seeds away from the plant. There are also many, uh, exploding cucumbers in that video, which you'll see use jets of water to shoot the seeds. 
There are seeds that hitch rides. So you may have experienced this with your dog or your shoelaces if you've been hiking. Um, these get tangled up in those shoelaces or the dog's fur, um, things like burrs and tick seeds. Um, they've got little hooks on them so that they can get carried around. And then there are seeds that can float, like coconuts. Coconuts can actually float in water. And then you're probably familiar with flying seeds if you've ever uh, blown on a dandelion. So those have that little tuft so they can fly. Um, and then um, helicopters, maple seeds, the ones that spin when they fall. Um, ash and several other tree species have those types of seeds as well. So we're going to start with the gymnosperms first because they were the first ones to evolve seeds and because of that they actually became the dominant plants on earth for a while because they were able to move into those new habitats with these seeds that other plants had not been able to get to before. So who are the gymnosperms? Here's some pictures of some of them um, and I'll have the characteristics on the next slide. So we've got conifers. These are the group that you would know probably most by their other name, the evergreens. These are the ones that keep their leaves or needles year round. So firs, pines, um, cypress trees, these are the, the uh, conifers. We've got cycads. They look kind of like palm trees, but they are a separate group because they are more closely related to pine trees than they are palm trees. Palm trees belong to the angiosperms. Um, then we've got this group over here that ephedra belongs to and that is the nidophytes. Um, these guys are usually found in hotter dry areas while the pine trees um, are usually found in colder dry areas. And then we have one member of the ginkgo group. It's the only species that exists. Um, you might have seen these around in Ohio and other northern states. They actually aren't native to the United States, but they are used as a decorative tree because of their unique leaves. You can see they're real pretty fan shapes. Um, and these leaves actually turn bright yellow in the fall right before they fall off. So they're very pretty tree uh, commonly used in neighborhoods and so forth for decoration. So you can see there are the groups, conifers, cycads, nidophytes, and ginkgos. So what do they have in common? So they all have vascular tissue, so they do have that transportation system for materials to get to the different parts of the plant. Um, they keep their gametes in cones, so um, for reproduction they are actually going to use cones. You're probably familiar with those from things like pine trees and we'll take a look at those here in a second. Um, one of the gametes, instead of making sperm like we've seen in the other two plant groups previously, they're actually going to pack their sperm into pollen and that pollen instead of having tails and needing water it's going to get moved by the wind. And then the last big one is the seeds. So once the pollen meets up with the ovule or the egg, it's going to fertilize and produce a seed. So those are the major characteristics for gymnosperms. Um, and we'll see that there are some different characteristics that show up in the last group are angiosperms. So here's what the cones look like. Most of you are familiar with this cone. If I had said pine cone, this is what you probably picture. Um, this is actually the female cone. So this is the part that makes the eggs or the ovules. And each of these, what we call scales, actually would have a possible seed. Um, and when this one is actually in the process of opening, so the seeds are ready, um, these will all open up and the wind will blow through and blow the seeds out. The seeds for pine trees have little wings on them because that's how they're going to get moved around. The seeds for gymnosperms are moved by wind. The pollen is going to be moved by wind as well. Um, each of these little cones is just packed full of pollen. These are all individual male cones. These guys, as you might be able to tell, are on the tips of the branches. Um, and so why are they on the tips of the branches? Because they need to be reached by the wind. And so we want to get as much of that pollen out of the cones as possible. So we put them out on the tips so that the wind will blow out and carry that pollen over to the female cones. So quick look at the gymnosperm life cycle because we've looked at the other two groups so far. 
The big thing to look at here and notice is that there are not two uh, separate life stages. There's not a diploid and a haploid separate life stage like we saw with the mosses and the ferns. We still do have a diploid and a haploid stage, but they're all located on one plant. So the diploid version is the what we consider like the conifer, um, so the pine tree, but the cones, the reproductive parts, are located on that diploid version, and those cones are going to do meiosis and create the haploid stage, create the pollen and the ovule or egg. The fertilization is going to happen right there, and it's going to go ahead and produce the seed. Those seeds will get blown away and grow into the new diploid version. So we've switched now from having two completely separate versions of the plant for the reproduction to having it all combine onto one organism. So conifers, these guys include the tallest living organisms and the longest living organisms. They are both trees, um, but they are, as far as we know, the tallest and longest living organisms on the planet, individual. So conifers, the redwoods, are the tallest. Um, they can reach up to 380 feet tall. The picture you see here doesn't include the whole tree. They're actually missing the base of the tree in the picture. That's how tall these uh, guys get. We can't get them all in one shot. The oldest ones are these bristlecone pines that you see in the picture in the bottom. Uh, bristlecone pines live at high elevation out in the mountain regions out west. They grow incredibly slowly, and this number here um, has actually changed. We know that there's a tree that is at least 4,900 years old. So very, very slow growing um, and not very tall. If I was to stand next to it, um, I, my head would only come to about here. Um, so not very big trees, incredibly slow growing because of the area that they grow in. So how are they able to do this? Um, even the uh, trees in the angiosperm group, the next group that we'd be looking at, um, can grow to long ages, um, but these guys are really good at it. Well, any kind of tree has wood in it, um, and that wood is very strong and resistant to being eaten by herbivores, whether it's an insect or an animal, um, you know, a bigger animal like, um, you know, a bird or, uh, you know, any sort of critter. Um, so that wood is really tough and um, hard to chew, but also tough to actually digest. So it's not very easy to get um, through that material. Uh, also, conifers have what we call heartwood. This is found in the center of the trunk. And if you've ever noticed in a windstorm, uh, conifers tend to bend a lot more. They're a lot more flexible without breaking. And it's because of this heartwood. It's strong material, but it's flexible material. And so it allows them to bend without breaking. The bark on trees, especially if you think about conifers, they have a lot thicker bark than other trees. Um, and that gives them an extra layer of protection against those herbivores. And the last one that's a big one is that conifers make pine pitch. Um, if you've ever tried to climb a pine tree, or if you've ever worked on a pine tree or found a broken branch, you have probably found pine pitch. It's very, very sticky material, and it's there to protect the tree against attack. Um, it will seal up cuts on the tree. Um, if an insect starts chewing on it, it will um, exude this. And this is actually the material that turns into amber, and that's how we've gotten a lot of fossilized insects from, you know, up to uh, like a hundred million years ago that have perfectly uh, preserved insects and reptile pieces and bird pieces because of this amber material from this pine pitch. All right, that's where I'm going to end this lecture and I will pick up with the next lecture with our flowering plants, which is our biggest and most diverse group of plants.